I was a child, I have been fascinated with the brain. This convoluted mess of gray and white matter that allows us to sense, to create, to ponder the existential questions about our universe. But as a trained neuroscientist, I've sometimes wondered if we would have been better off if our brain came with a warning sign, use with extreme caution. And underneath that, it would say, and only once you've read the user manual. Because let's face it, how often have we actually thought about how the brain works? And maybe if we did have a user manual, we would uncover that the brain has a fundamental design flaw, one that requires a lot of attention. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking your brain might have a design flaw. My brain does not. It cannot be fooled. Think you can't be fooled though? Think again because maybe you just were. And herein lies the flaw. For as incredible as our brain is, it is actually really lazy in that it does no more work than it has to in order to just maintain the status quo. And in order to work not too hard, it has developed a set of tools, shortcuts, like the one you may have just experienced. Now to answer the question, why did our brain evolve this way? We have to take a step back in time to our ancestors. Back then, they were concerned mainly with two things. If they were gonna eat and if they were gonna be eaten. So they had to conserve energy in order to stay alive. Things like critical thinking, analyzing, paying attention, all these things use up energy. They also had to make sense of information really quickly in case that information contained imminent danger. So the brain evolved these shortcuts to deal with these immediate demands. And as a result, we make judgments and decisions and impressions in the split of a second before we've had all the evidence to fully support it. Now, these types of cognitive tools, they made sense back then. But the world that we live in today is a very different one. Take, for example, in 2011, Americans took in five times more information than they did back in 1986. That is equivalent to 174 newspapers a day. That is a lot of newspapers and a lot of information that the brain has to filter through using these outdated shortcuts. Shortcuts using or ignoring a repeated word is one thing, but shortcuts that can profoundly alter the way we view the world and the people in it now that's a very different thing. And we know those shortcuts as biases. Now throughout my career, I've experienced firsthand how devastating biases can be. For example, working in the cancer field, I've seen how biases have led some parents to make the decision not to vaccinate their children with the HPV vaccine, a vaccine that can actually prevent certain cancers. I've seen how biases have contributed to us falling for misinformation especially around politically charged subjects like climate change. So it seems to me, at least the scientists anyway, that we need that user manual now more than ever. So I'd like to share with you a toolkit, a three simple tools that you can start using today to overcome some of these shortcuts. And they can be boiled down to detect, diversify, and double check. Now, Close your eyes for me for a second and picture a scientist. What do you see? Okay, if you picture a male, you're in good company because studies have shown that the majority of us subconsciously and strongly associate men with science, but not women. Now, as an outspoken advocate for women in STEM, this makes me really mad. Except when I took a test to evaluate my own bias on this, and it turns out that I, too, strongly associate men with science and not women. It gets worse. I also discovered that I have a strong automatic association for men with career and women with family. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but as a working career woman in science, this was really hard for me to acknowledge, especially because it goes against everything I consciously value. So what are we to do with this? We go to 
Tool number one, detect. Detecting our biases and bringing them to the forefront is crucial. In the scientific field, for example, a recent study just showed that more women were, scientists were promoted when the selection committee members became consciously aware of their own gender bias and the negative impact it can have on women, proving that just becoming aware of one's own biases can make a huge, profound impact on a centuries-old problem. And you too can uncover and become aware of your own biases by using the same tool that I did. Project Implicit is an online resource that provides up to about 90 different tests to evaluate your biases on a whole host of things, ranging from gender to sexuality to age, you name it, there's a test for it. And best of all, it's free and it's available in 25 different languages, so no excuses. And if you're sitting there thinking that, I don't need to take any tests because I am not biased about anything. I'm here to tell you that there is in fact a name for the very bias that you are currently experiencing, <laughs> and that is called the bias blind spot. It is our tendency to not compensate for our own biases. It's why everybody thinks that they themselves are not biased. So, <laughs> tool number one, detect your biases. Now that's all very well and good, but what about those really deep-seated beliefs that you have? You know the ones. The ones you vow not to bring up during the holidays with your family in case of accidentally evoking World War III, immigration, gun control, abortion, gay marriage. Now, having strong beliefs about these things, that's not a bad thing, and we all have them. But when we're not open to new ideas and information about them, now that's when it can be become detrimental. Science shows us that we, when we hold on to a really deep personal belief, when we are presented evidence to counter that belief, it activates two areas of our brain. The first is thought to be associated with self-identity. In other words, who we think we are. The second, with pain and emotion. In other words, when you receive a counter-argument about a, self, a deep self-belief you have, it's like you just received a personal insult. And what happens is that your protective brain kicks into high gear, it clings onto that belief even stronger, we dig our heels in even deeper, and we eventually become completely unwilling to even consider the information at hand. It's called the backfire effect. But what if that counter-information was accurate and useful? Turns out there is something that we can do to make sure that we are open to new ideas that may challenge those deep-seated beliefs. And this brings me to tool number two, diversify. Studies have shown that the simple act of making sure you surround yourself with a network of people and opinions that are different than your own helps. I mean, kind of a no-brainer, right? No pun intended, of course. But the thing is, it's way more challenging than what that sounds like, and left to our own devices, we do a pretty lousy job at it. But I think there is a simple way to overcome that. And you know by now, the brain loves simple. And that is capitalizing on the power of social media. Now, hear me out. There are currently 3.5 billion users of social media. That equates to half of our entire human population, all accessible at the click of a button. I mean, how much easier can it get than that? But there's a positive bonus to this, and that is social media has actually started to democratize science. In other words, scientists no longer have to keep their knowledge locked away in journals behind paywalls anymore. On Twitter, for example, there's an entire army of scientists who share their knowledge and their expertise every day on that platform on almost every science topic. Think about it. You want to check an assumption about climate change? There's the scientist for that. You want to settle a disagreement once and for all about fracking? There's an expert for that. So consider using social media as a tool to diversify that network. And here's the thing. If you do do that, and you start to become uncomfortable about becoming out of your, your context, well, that's a good thing. Because a recent study showed that if we're not outside of our comfort zone, we actually stop learning. 
In other words, stability shuts down the brain's learning centers. And surrounding ourselves with people that have opinions we may disagree with is actually one way that we can boost both empathy and learning. So tool number two, diversify your network and capitalize on the power of social media. That's all well and good. As long as you are judicious about who you follow and what you choose to engage with online, right? I mean, let's face it, even those that we trust sometimes can share information that's wrong or misleading online. And that brings me to tool number three, double check. Studies have shown that when it comes to believing or deciding what to trust and what to share online, that we are more attentive to the share of the information than we are to the actual content and the source of the information. We also tend to share and like information that others share and like. It's called the bandwagon effect. But the problem is, again, sometimes this leads us into that bad misinformation trap. And so there is an easy tool that we can use to detect the BS online, and it is called Wait for it, the crap test. <laughs> Developed by Sarah Blakesley at the, at the California State University, Chico, it's an easy evaluation test for any information that you can find online, anytime, anyplace, anywhere. Just ask yourself, is it crap? The currency of the information. In other words, the timeliness that you find this information in your hands the relevancy, or is it meeting your immediate demands for that information? The authority, this is a really important one. Who wrote the information? What is the website you're getting it from? What are the sources? Who funded the study? Accuracy, how reliable and truthful is it? And finally, purpose, what is its sole reasoning for existence in the first place? And if you're still uncertain about information online, there are several, several reputable online fact-checking websites that include Snopes, factcheck.org, and Open Secrets. This is really important for those salacious headlines that your brain just cannot get enough of. So, simple steps to double check. Now, in my journey in learning about the brain, it's become an, an awakening of sorts. The revelation, the revelation that every action, every reaction, every interaction is done so through the lens of a shortcut is profound, don't you think? But it's also empowering because now that you know about it, you can do something about it. And although our brain didn't come with a user manual, it did provide us something even more powerful, curiosity. My hope is that by sharing this toolkit with you today, that this will pique a curiosity about the brain and how it works, and this will lead to a greater learning expedition. Learning to become critical about what you see and believe online. Learning to seek out new experiences and different perspectives. Learning to overcome your shortcuts. Because in the end, learning becomes knowledge, and knowledge is power. And you can thank your brain for that. Thank you.